This is a joint effort with some collaborators from the Casper Lab at FIU. So in this research, we focus on uh, de-anonymizing fraudulent activities in peer opinion sites. We focus on Google Play, which is uh, uh, the largest uh, Android app market, currently hosting over 2 million apps. Uh, the way uh, Google Play works is that you have developers who develop and upload apps to, to the system, and then you have users that can um, search for different uh, type of apps and install them. And then they can give feedback, they can rate or review the app. Okay, so, um, but uh, Google Play has a problem. It hosts a suite of fraudulent behaviors such as app developers uh, that try to promote uh, artificially their products. So they try to alter the search rank of their apps through fake reviews and installs. Um, the way they do this is by the, uh, hiring ex expert crowdsourcing fraudsters that are able to provide thousands of installs or hundreds of reviews for the, the target apps. Yeah. So previous work focused on fraud detection. Uh, so we argue that fraud detection is not uh, effective enough. Uh, this is the classifying reviews as uh, honest or versus fake. Uh, doesn't stop uh, these prolific fraudsters. Uh, doesn't stop th these fraudsters. And uh, by the way, this picture was taken and volunteered by one of the fraudsters with whom we interacted. And he approved uh, our use of this picture. Okay. The fraudsters can advertise uh, their skills through crowdsourcing sites. For instance, here we can see that uh, some fraudsters uh, can earn thousands of dollars from hundreds of work hours in these sites. And this uh, is further evidence that fraud detection is not being enough. Okay, so in order to understand the problem, we go and uh, contacted 100 fraudsters and we could recruit 23 of them. They were able to to reveal between 22 to 86 accounts that they control on Google Play. In total, we could have uh, we had um, 942 accounts, and we then go ahead and collect 640 apps that uh, they review from those uh, from those 942 accounts. Okay, so, so some of these fraudsters claim to control uh, hundreds or even thousands of accounts in this uh, in Google Play. So we introduce uh, the fraud de anonymization problem. Who, given suspicious accounts on Google Play, uh, shown on the right, we want to identify the crowdsourcing side fraudsters that control them, shown on the on the left side. Um. So uh, peer opinion sites like Google Play can pursue these fraudsters, for instance, by getting their financial account details. Okay, so we have proposed uh, two approaches to solve uh, the, the fraud de anonymization problem. One is called uh, unconstrained optimization, and the other one is called uh, discriminative de anonymization. Okay, I'm gonna start with the unconstrained approach. Okay. So the problem is the following. We have uh, a, now, uh, a set of known fraudsters in the peer opinion side, let's say Google Play, and we have uh, some products, some apps that they have reviewed. Okay, and then we have another account, uh, suspicious to be fraudulent on the right, uh, and we have a review history. A review history means uh, all the apps that this account has reviewed so the problem is we want to determine, is this account controlled by any of these fraudsters? Okay. So we, we, we need to introduce the concept of the fraudster profile. We have a, a, cyber, a, a fraudster and, um, who had, and we have some seed accounts that we know he controls. Uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to partition all the the all the the apps that he controls into different sets that have different features. So, for instance, one uh, set 
could be apps that uh, have many reviews and have many reviewers in common, while other set could be apps that uh, uh, receive few reviews and share few reviewers in common. Okay, so given these profiles, we propose to compute the likelihood uh, that a given suspicious account with review history arcade is controlled by a froster W that has a profile FW. Okay, so, so we now are able to transform the de-anonymization problem into an optimization problem whose goal is to find the worker with profile FW that maximizes this function. Okay, uh, given this formulation, uh, we prove the following, uh, uh, the following, the following theorem. Uh, and you can see the details in the paper. So while I don't have the time to to go into the details, uh, what it is saying is that large intersection sizes from unpopular set of apps are likely to, to come from review histories that are controlled by, by the same worker. So earlier I mentioned that we have the two approaches for the for the de-anonymization problem. So I just cover the unconstrained approach. Now I'm gonna describe the second solution, which is uh, discriminative de-anonymization. So th this is the big picture. And in the following slides, I will describe <coughs> several of these components. Okay, uh, we, we uh, base our solution on the concept of coactivity graph. So coactivity graph, um, model uh, common behavior between accounts. So use, uh, nodes are users and you have uh, uh, links that uh, connect accounts that have previewed uh, uh, other apps in common. So for instance, in this co-activity graph, what we built it over an app that was uh, targeted by four frosters. Uh, you can see the different colors here for each uh, froster. So it seems easy to assign an account to a community, but this is not always the case. So for instance, who controls accounts such as this? So to solve this problem, we, intro, we, we use deep learning algorithms to extract features from graph. We're gonna use specifically, we, we're gonna use deep walk, which extracts features from from weighted random walks on the graph. So uh, random walks will gravitate towards well-connected nodes likely to be controlled by the same worker. So uh, so uh, deep learning, deep walk is gonna allow us to, to go to from the graph domain to to uh, Euclidean domain. So now that we have um, the deep cluster, the deep walk features, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna use k-means to cluster accounts in the coactivity graph of each app. Um, and then we're gonna use some seed information that we got to attribute clusters. So for instance, in this, um, if you have uh, accounts in one cluster that is controlled uh, mainly by only one worker, one could attribute the whole cluster to that froster but in a sort of a guilt by association inference. So if you have in the same cluster with, when only you have one worker, so it's, we can, one can say that uh, it's controlled by that worker. But uh, we, we don't do that because we can have clusters like this that have conflicting information for which uh, uh, attribution becomes ambiguous. Okay, in, or, in order to solve this problem, we introduce the co-ownership predictor. The co-ownership predictor predicts if two accounts suspected of fraud are controlled by the same fraudster. We look at things that they have in common, like how many apps uh, they have reviewed in common. And we also go uh, more in depth and uh, see uh, all the clusters for these apps. And we're gonna see how many times do they actually appear together in the same cluster. And we record all this information as features, the number of apps in common for those apps, how many times they appear in the same cluster. And then 
We also look at features that has to do with the differences in review times and in the start ratings. We're gonna use this feature then to train supervised uh, algorithms. So now that we have the co-ownership predictor, we can deal with ambiguous clusters that have multiple <coughs> workers in it. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take one node and we're gonna, the, the nodes in, in that cluster, and we're gonna use the other uh, Frouster control accounts and we're gonna use the co-ownership predictor and we're gonna predict, oh, are, are they controlled by the same worker? And we're gonna do this for all the, the Frouster control accounts and then, but still, uh, we can have one account that is predicted to be controlled by multiple frosters using the co-ownership predictor. But we, what we do is to extract features that measure the co-ownership, the, the strength of the, the relationship between an account and all the frosters. And we're going to build another classifier that is going to predict, which is the worker that control, the, the froster that control that account. So remember that we have uh, collected 942 accounts from these uh, frosters. Uh, initially, we validate our solutions with this, uh, with this uh, uh, set of data. We first evaluate the co-ownership uh, predictor uh, with uh, almost uh, 18,000 pair of accounts. Uh, from which we have 20, uh, 80 percent that were positive links, meaning that the two accounts are controlled by by the same clusters, <coughs> and we also have 20 percent which are negative links, meaning that they're controlled by different clusters. Uh, we compared our solution with the state of the art, uh, which is called LCDET, published earlier this year in NDSS, uh, and we outperformed it by uh, 12 percent, 12 percentage point. Now, we, moving forward, uh, we compare our two solutions using this uh, uh, data set. We have the unconstrained and the, the discriminative de-anonymization. Um, for the discriminative de-anonymization, we show the top three performing uh, supervised learning algorithms, and we saw that we could achieve an F1 measure of 94.5%. So discriminative de-anonymization leverage more features uh, and uh, this explains why it's better than, than the other. We now uh, go ahead and process accounts and try to find, and we found uh, 3,500 newly attributed accounts that belongs to the existing the set of 23 workers. Um, we also found orthogonal evidence of co ownership between the, uh, the accounts of that, that by noticing that. Uh, they uh, plagiarize the reviews written by the seed accounts. Okay, so we measure like how similar are the reviews, and we found that, the, for instance, the, the plot on the bottom shows the amount of cell plagiarism between the new attributed accounts and uh, compared with the seed account of each worker. Okay, one problem we have is that we don't have a way to validate these results. I mean, we, we were able to, to attribute these 3,500 accounts, but how do we know for sure that uh, these are actually controlled by these frosters? So we need a technique to, to, to validate this information. So our idea was to use uh, uh, frosters as human oracles that tell us whether we are right or wrong. So we propose a three-step process. We First, ask frosters to reveal <laughs> accounts that they control. So uh, we, we then use those reveal accounts and uh, our solution, our de-anonymizer, to find other accounts likely to be controlled by those frosters. And the, in the final step, we propose, uh, we, des we design a questionnaire to ask froster to confirm if they, if they control uh, these accounts or not. But Froster can cheat, and this is obviously not a surprise. And we took this into consideration when we developed this protocol. One way they can cheat is that when we ask them to rebuild the accounts, they could tell us, they could pick some random accounts and claim ownership. So one way to fix this is by 
asking them to give us the Gmail addresses of these accounts. And this is good because then we have a way to confirm that these account, that, that these accounts correspond to some e e Gmail addresses. Correspond to these Gmail addresses. Uh, and then we, we went further. We were going to pick one of these uh, uh, accounts, email addresses that he revealed, and we're going to communicate with him using this email address. If he is not able to reply, uh, we discard uh, this roster. Another way they, they can cheat is, by, is when we ask them to confirm control of the accounts. So they can confirm or deny in an arbitrary fashion. Uh, so it, it will be hard for us to, to tell if they're lying or not. Uh, to, to deal with this problem, we are gonna uh, check uh, their attention and their honesty. We're gonna add bogus accounts, accounts that we know that he cannot control because we either create those accounts or we just uh, pick accounts that we know for sure are honest. Or, and we also gonna add accounts that we know they control because they rebuilt these accounts in the first step. Uh, so the fraudster need to be able to answer these accounts correctly. So further, what we have done, if and only if the fraudster is able to, to answer these accounts correctly, this means that he was able to deny control of the, of the bogus accounts and also confirm control of the accounts that we know that he controls. Only then we're going to pick another set of accounts that we predict that he controls and for which we don't know the answer only then. And we're going to send a random token to these uh, accounts. And he has to retrieve this token for us. So, so we conducted a live validation of our solution. Uh, we, we could contact uh, and hire another set of 16 frosters. Each revealed uh, 10 accounts. So from these 160 accounts, we were able to collect 718 apps and there are almost 300,000 reviews. So in the last step, we use five total accounts. We use five uh, uh, test accounts. We, we include uh, two uh, bogus accounts and three known to be control accounts and five uh, suspected accounts by, provided by our algorithms. And here on the green, on the green part of the bars, we show how well they do in terms of honesty. So we can see that uh, only one froster uh, didn't answer absolutely correctly. So he claimed that he don't remember if he controlled or not that account. So we, we didn't disqualify this froster because you know uh, don't remember is still a reasonable doubt. And on the top part of the bars, we show how well we did. So these are like the accounts that our solution suggested. And we see that for three, for three, for three accounts that we suggested, the, the froster say that he, he, he doesn't control it. And for four accounts, he claims that he doesn't remember. So we, we obtain a precision of 91%. Okay, so in summary, so we introduced the fraud de-anonymization problem. We presented two approaches to solve this problem. One is uh, unconstrained optimization, MLE-based de-anonymization. And we also proposed a discriminative de-anonymization. We propose a validation protocol that uses uh, human as, uh, that uses uh, frosters as human oracles. And we, we saw that frosters are willing to cooperate if we give them incentive. Okay, and with that, I will take questions. Uh, please, please come up to the mic if you have a question. Ten dollars. Uh, uh, 
so you mentioned that you see a binary identification of fraud accounts is inefficient. And I believe, uh, if I understand correctly, you said that the evidence of that is that there's a thriving market for fraudulent reviews, right? But I, I wonder if you have insight as to what part of that process it makes the binary identification insufficient. Is it that it takes too long to detect an account? Is that it, the accuracy is not high enough? Is it that uh, it's just too easy to create new review accounts and so forth? I think it's a combination of some of them. Because, for instance, it's easy to create uh, new accounts. I mean, you can create uh, accounts uh, really easily in Google Play. And also, I think it takes some time to 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 block those uh, accounts. And and do you you know when thinking about it in that context, do you feel that this type of fraud attribution is going to be more effective? No, uh, it's going to complement fraud detection. Okay. Hi, just have a quick question on like how do you make sure there's no like sampling bias on on the twenty three. Uh, users you, you collected because I assume you just find an online forum from like the, the, the founders that actually post things for advertising and you ask them whether they want to reveal their accounts so I think there will be like certain biases of those people compared to normal like the, the other people other founders right yeah uh, there is always going to be bias when you do this and uh, we could collect this from, I mean, the, the, these workers were collected from freelancer Upwork and they claim to control more than uh, 50, 50 accounts. So they, they claim to, to, to have uh, done this kind of job for a long time. So and most of these fraudsters are actually from Bangladesh. So yes, I think we have uh, some sampling bias there. So. I think like follow up question. I think like your assumption is that each each foster has their certain amount of uh, accounts, and when accounts only have one person contributing, will be like cases where like say a certain like group of people has like a set of accounts, and they have a set of people who just contribute to each of the accounts. So each account can be posed by a lot of different people. Will that influence your detection? So you say, so yeah. if I understand the question correctly, you, you're saying that there can be honest users that do this? Too? Oh, no, I'm saying that right now, the assumption right now is you have one person con uh, control one account, right? Well, yeah. like one account is controlled by one person. But there will be the case where it's like a malicious entity has a lot of accounts that was controlled by a lot of people. So each account can be posed by different people, different attackers that will have different behavior like traits. No, but for, in in the setting of our problem, the, they will be controlled by the same identity. Okay, okay so we have uh, one froster and this froster have actually in the picture that I show, that was uh, one company. So you have one company and you have many frosters uh, that belong to that company and they have different devices. but in our setting, we treat this as only one froster. Right, thank you. Hey, so in your two methods, the first method was doing an optimization over the set of fraudsters, and the second one uh, started with seeds known to be controlled by the set of fraudsters. So how does your, how well will your scheme detect fraud accounts controlled by different fraudsters you've never talked to and you don't have seeds for. Okay. Yeah, I, I couldn't show this because of time constraints, but uh, we, we, I have this. Four slides. We, we call this pseudonymous fraudster discovery. So we, we also find clusters that are from accounts that tend to also review a lot of things, but we don't know the, if they actually belong to one worker. But we found these big clusters that we suspect are also controlled by other frosters that we, we don't get to know yet. So it is, in this part, we use uh, the co-ownership predictor with accounts that we don't know. So they appear in clusters that only have unknown accounts. That the, So in the clustering processes that we have, we, we can get clusters that only have unknown accounts and they actually appear in multiple clusters. So that's suspicious. So we run the co-ownership predictor there and predict if, they, if they're controlled by the same froster. And then we form, uh, we run a, a, a component detection algorithm on that graph that we get. And we could find this big 
communities that we suspect belong to other frosters. Great, thanks. And that's all the time we have, so let's thank Nestor. Thank you.